cysts in the jaw. This course about cysts in the jaw is part of an online course in oral pathology for dental students. All clinical pictures and radiographs are taken by Dr. Bjarte Grung, who is a Norwegian specialist in oral surgery and oral medicine. The pictures are archival material from his practice, and since they represent only a very limited area of the body, they cannot be identified to any person. The histological cases are all from the Department of Pathology, Haukeland University Hospital, Bergen, Norway. No clinical pictures or radiographs may be copied from this course. The histological pictures may be copied for other educational purposes. This course is based on the classification of cysts published in WHO classification of head and neck tumors from 2017. As you may see, this classification includes much more than cysts in the jaws. The list includes also odontogenic tumors and bone tumors, which I will present in another course. Here I have highlighted what this course will include. Odontogenic cysts of inflammatory origin, that is radicular cysts and inflammatory collateral cysts. And odontogenic and non-odontogenic developmental cysts, which includes dentidrous cyst, odontogenic keratocyst, lateral periodontal cyst and buttery odontogenic cyst, gingival cyst, glandular odontogenic cyst, calcifying odontogenic cyst, orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst and nasopalatine duct cyst. I will go through these cysts one by one. What are the characteristics of the cysts clinically, on radiographs and histologically? This will be exemplified by clinical pictures, radiographs and biopsy cases from our archival material at Haukeland University Hospital. So, what is a cyst? A cyst is an epithelial-lined pathologic cavity, most often filled with liquid. The cavity should not be preformed, that means that the maxillary sinus is not a cyst, since it is preformed and not pathologic. In the jaws there are remnants of epithelium from the tooth development. The teeth are formed by ingrowth of epithelium, which is thereafter resorbed. However, some remnants will persist, and these may be triggered by a stimulus and start to grow, which may be the start of cyst formation. Such odontogenic rests of epithelium may be, for instance, rests of malaceus, reduced enamelate epithelium, rests of dental lamina, or Non-odontogenic rests, for instance, remnants of nasopalatine duct. I will mention some general points about cysts in the jaw. Most cysts are intraosseous. Only the gingival cyst and the nasolabial cysts are in the soft tissue. The nasolabial cyst is not on the WHO list, but will be mentioned by the end of the cyst course. Only the inflammatory cysts may be related to infection. The others are developmental cysts. The cyst may be discovered on x-ray accidentally. That means that the patients have no pain or other symptoms and that there may be no clinical findings like, for instance, swelling. In other cases, the cyst may give clinical symptoms. The teeth are vital except for radicular cysts. This fact states the importance of taking vitality tests before making a clinical diagnosis. Some have high recurrency rate and may be aggressive. This is especially relevant for the odontogenic keratocyst since this cyst is a rather common cyst, about 10-20% of all cysts in the jaw. 
The list of odontogenic cysts in the jaw includes radiculocyst and inflammatory collateral cyst. Radiculocyst is by far the most common and is related to the apex of a necrotic tooth. The inflammatory collateral cyst is related to partially or recently erupted teeth and there are two types, the paradental cyst and the mandibular buccal bifurcation cyst. The last type of odontogenic inflammatory cysts is the residual cyst. This is a cyst which is often discovered on routine examination, sometime after tooth extraction. Obviously, not all epithelium has been eliminated after tooth extraction and a cyst has developed. In this slide, I will go through the pathogenesis of the radicular cyst which is an odontogenic cyst of inflammatory origin associated with a non-vital necrotic tooth. The picture on the left is the development of a periapical granuloma, while the one on the right is the further development of a radicular cyst. On the right column, the process is described schematically. The start is a necrotic pulp, most often due to caries or trauma. The necrotic debris will find a way through the apex of the tooth to the periodontal membrane and induce an inflammatory reaction in the periodontal membrane in the apical region. Since the necrotic material will keep on inducing inflammation this will lead to chronic inflammation and bone resorption and after a time a lesion that will be visible on a radiograph. We have a periapical granuloma. Epithelial rests of malacea that are present in the periapical granuloma may be stimulated to grow by growth factors from the inflammatory cells and that is the start of a cyst formation. After some time the epithelium has formed a cyst cavity and a radicular cyst has been developed. This is another schematic way of describing the clinical consequences of pulp necrosis. If a tooth is infected heavily by bacteria, a periapical abscess may develop. This is illustrated to the left in the figure. In this case, there is acute inflammation with the classical clinical signs leading to increased pressure in the bone cavity and accordingly pain. In addition, there will be exudation and pus formation and the pus may be drained through a fistula which may end up either on the vestibular fornix in the oral cavity or on the skin dependent on which tooth that is affected. Alternatively, if there is some drainage the acute situation may decline and the lesion may develop into a more chronic situation as a periapical granuloma illustrated to the right on the figure and possibly further development into a radicular cyst. Radiologically, a radicular cyst will always be seen as a radiolucency since there is loss of bone. The size may vary from a few millimeters to several centimeters. The shape is round or ovoid and it is unilocular. Quite often there is a narrow opaque margin of the radiolucency. The lesion may have resorbed the tooth apex and even neighboring teeth and this may be reflected on the radiograph. And lastly, there is no 
absolute criteria to differentiate between periapical granulomas and radicular cysts. When a lesion is big, for instance more than one centimeter, it is more likely a cyst. However, this may not be the case and even small lesions of only five millimeters may contain a cyst lumen. This slide shows examples of radiographs of radicular cysts from different patients. Some teeth have been endodontically treated, but this has not been sufficient for complete healing, while other teeth with periapical radiolucencies have only a regular filling of the tooth. In some cases, there is root resorption, especially in the picture in the upper row to the left. In the picture in the lower row to the left, there are two radiolucencies on the roots of the tooth 4-6. In this case, the cyst wall is also especially well demarcated, while periapical radiolucencies on other pictures have a more diffuse borderline. This slide shows an expected premolar with a deep carious lesion and some soft tissue attached to the root apex. We can fix the expected tooth in formalin, split it and decalcify the hard tissue. After that, sections from the specimen must be stained with hematoxylin and eosin, and so they are ready to be studied in a microscope. We can see the decalcified tooth with dentin and cementum and the cell-rich soft tissue which is attached to the apex of the tooth. This is a closer-up of the periapical area where you can see the irregular border of the apex confirming tooth resorption and also the cell-rich connective tissue full of inflammatory cells. The diagnosis is periapical granuloma related to expected tooth. An even closer up showing the chronic inflammatory cells. In this case it is predominated by plasma cells. We proceed to another biopsy also taken from the periapical region. In this case also the tooth is expected due to pain. This is also a solid tissue. No cyst lumen can be seen and there is a central zone which is more cell rich compared with the periphery. We focus on the central area which is full of inflammatory cells and dilated blood vessels tightly packed with erythrocytes. And there is also a central area with exudate seen as a pinkish liquid in the picture. This may be the initial phase of abscess formation. Closer up you may see the exudate and the neutrophil granulocytes in addition to scattered erythrocytes. This is a typical picture of an active inflammation. Increased pressure due to active inflammation may explain why this lesion has caused pain. And the diagnosis is periapical granuloma with active inflammation. The next biopsy is also from a carious tooth. And also in this case there is soft tissue attached to the apex. The biopsy has been decalcified before sectioning and staining. In this case, there is a central lumen in the soft tissue indicating cyst formation. This is confirmed on this slide where you can see the cyst wall with epithelium towards the cyst lumen and the outer fibrous capsule. The borderline of the tooth apex is irregular, which indicates that the apex has been resorbed. In the cyst lumen, there are cholesterol clefts and remnants of cells and blood. Clinically, this will be seen as a highly viscous, grainy, yellowish liquid. This is a closer up of the biopsy, confirming that the epithelium is a non keratinized squamous epithelium, which is typical for a radicular cyst. The capsule consists of fibrous connective tissue with only some few scattered inflammatory cells. Another biopsy from a periapical cystic lesion. The biopsy has been cut into two parts. 
You can see a cystic lesion with a central lumen lined by epithelium. The cyst wall varies in thickness, some parts are really thin, while there are other areas which have a thicker fibrous cyst wall. Inflammation is especially localized in the subepithelial area, while the outer zone has much less inflammation. This indicates that the stimulus for inflammation lies in the cyst lumen. This is a close-up of an area with a hypoplastic non-keratinized squamous epithelium with branching retoridges making a network. Between the retoridges there is connective tissue with inflammation. Also, there are inflammatory cells in the epithelium. Growth factors from the inflammatory cells may explain the proliferation of the epithelium. And the diagnosis is radiculocyst. This is a new biopsy from a periapical lesion. The tooth has been endodontically treated some years back, but radiolucency persisted. Apicoectomy was therefore performed and soft tissue was sent as biopsy. The biopsy shows irregular pieces of homogeneous fibrous tissue. No epithelium can be seen. On a closer up, we can confirm that the biopsy contains densely packed fibrous tissue with only few fibroblasts and hardly any inflammatory cells. In conclusion, there has been a healing process, but bone formation has not occurred. Instead, healing is with fibrosis. This may, however, not be possible to confirm before a biopsy has been taken. And the diagnosis is periapical fibrosis compatible with scar formation. This is a biopsy from a periapical lesion. The tooth had been endodontically treated some years back, but radiolucency persisted. Apicoectomy was therefore performed and soft tissue was sent as biopsy. The biopsy consists of an irregular piece of soft tissue. There is no epithelium. Mainly there is fibrous tissue, but what is striking is the hard tissue formation. Some of the hard tissue is lost during sectioning since the tissue has not been decalcified. Also, there is some greyish substance in quite large areas and also some yellowish material. These are foreign bodies. In closer up, we can see that the greyish granules have been phagocytized by macrophages and are localized intracellularly. The other arrow points to the hard tissue where we can see remnants of the same granules. These foreign bodies are calcium hydroxide. The calcium hydroxide is very basic and will induce hard tissue formation. However, in this case the tooth has been overfilled and the calcium hydroxide has been pressed into the periodontal membrane. And the diagnosis is periapical granuloma with foreign bodies originated from endodontic treatment. This is another biopsy from a periapical lesion. The tooth had been endodontically treated some years back, but radiolucency persisted. Apicoectomy was therefore performed and soft tissue was sent as biopsy. This is a cystic lesion, and also in this case, the wall has a varying thickness. It is a cyst, since it is lined with an epithelium, and there is a dense inflammatory cell infiltrate in the cyst wall. As we have seen in a case before, the lumen is filled with remnants of cells, blood and cholesterol clefts. What is striking is the foreign bodies in the cyst lumen seen as some dark material attached to the cyst wall. These are also foreign bodies originating from endodontic treatment. In closer up, we can see that the foreign bodies are crystals and granules. Underneath, there is a layer of erythrocytes indicating some bleeding, and thereafter the non-keratinized cyst epithelium and inflamed connective tissue and the diagnosis is radicular cyst with foreign bodies originated from endodontic treatment. 
we will now look into the inflammatory collateral cysts that arise on the buccal aspect of the roots of partially or recently erupted teeth as a result of inflammation in the pericoronal tissues. This is a list of characteristics of the two types of inflammatory collateral cysts. They occur related to mandibular molars. The parodontal cyst is related to the third molar, with most often long-standing pericoronitis and symptoms of pain, swelling and trismus. It is related to a vital tooth and on radiograph it is well demarcated. It is superimposed over the buccal aspects of the roots of the teeth and it is distinct from the follicular space surrounding a partially erupted tooth. On the ha other hand, the mandibular buccal bifurcation cyst arises on the lower first and second molar. It is most often a pain and swelling, but infection with pain and separation may occur. The tooth is tilted buccally with deep periodontal pockets and on a radiograph there is a well demarcated buccal radiolucency which may extend to the lower border of the mandible. In a biopsy the picture will be like a radicular cyst with a cystic lesion lined with non-keratinized epithelium and with more or less inflammation in the cyst wall. The last type of odontogenic cysts of inflammatory origin is the residual cyst. These cysts may be without symptoms and discovered on routine examination or, as illustrated on this slide, be discovered because there is a swelling on the alveolar ridge where a tooth is missing. X-ray of this case shows a well demarcated radiolucency. Another radiograph from another case also shows a radiolucency in an edentulous area. Both cases were confirmed by biopsy to be residual cysts. This is a biopsy of a radiolucency discovered some years after extraction of tooth 26. This is a cystic lesion and as seen in other cases the cyst wall has varying thickness and the cyst wall is lined by epithelium towards the lumen. There is inflammation in the cyst wall and lumen is filled with remnants of cells, blood and cholesterol clefts as seen in other cases. A closer-up shows that the epithelium is a non-keratinized squamous epithelium. There are some scattered epithelial cells with cilia. This may be explained by the fact that the extracted tooth was a molar from the upper jaw with roots very close to the maxillary sinus. In the connected tissue there are cholesterol clefts and scattered chronic inflammatory cells. And the diagnosis is odontogenic cyst lined with squamous epithelium compatible with residual cyst. Mm -hmm.